Hello everyone and welcome to a short presentation on how to open source your research software. My name is Dirk Riedle. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Erlangen where I specialize in software engineering and open source software. I also provide commercial training on open source software through my company Bayf GmbH. To open source means to put some software under an open source license which by definition grants users, the recipients of the open source code, certain rights. The right to use the software for free, uh, to receive it in source code form, the right to modify it and use it for free in modified form and to pass it on to third parties. These are the rights that everyone can get or gets by way of an open source license. There are also potential obligations depending on how the software is used, but we'll get to that later. Most people who approach me about how to open source the research software start with the license. And that's wrong. Uh, it is exactly the wrong way to think about it. What you should be doing instead is to ask yourself, why am I open sourcing? What is the purpose of why I am going to make my source code, my research software source code, available for free. So here are my five steps of going through that process of open sourcing your research software and you have to start with clarifying why you do it. And then everything else, including the licenses, will follow from that. Having helped many colleagues the main purposes of open sourcing research software are these three. You either want to document your code, make it available because it's a requirement somehow. Maybe you want to support replication studies. Maybe a publication outlet requires yet that your code is available. So that's a code dump. The code in some sense is dead. You're not going to develop it further. You're just showing it to the world for some purpose. A second version and the most common form why people say I would like to open source is to create a community open source project, usually with the goal of sharing in the effort of developing it. Also sometimes to benefit from the innovation that can come if more people help you with the software development. Finally, if you're the original creator, you are probably building reputation with it. However, creating a successful community open source project comes with costs, which is your time and effort. You actually have to invest a lot of time usually before there even is a community. So think hard about the consequences of open sourcing with the purpose of trying to create a real community around your software rather than just dumping your code. Then there's a third version, which is less common but still exists, which is you want to commercialize your research software and you're testing the waters or you're going to market by way of making the software available for free under an open source license. So before you can do any of this, you need to clarify uh, whether you actually have the right to do that. So you may have a purpose in mind, but you may not be allowed to do it or you may not have the rights to do it. Why? Because software code is intellectual property and intellectual property is based on exclusion rights. Every single person who contributed in a non-trivial way to your source code has a right to exclude everyone else from using it, which means you need their permission to open source their code. And that applies to copyright foremost, so the copyright to the source code. It may apply to patent rights that may be involved and sometimes even to trademark rights. Usually though it's the copyright, the source code that was written. You need to get everyone's agreement. For that, you need to understand who actually contributed and holds rights in your project. And that may be a nasty surprise. So there are two situations, or it's a two by two matrix, where there is on the one hand the individual 
who if they contribute as an individual own the copyright to their work and hence may share in the copyright of your research software or it's the institution and so if it was work on behalf of the institution the institution owns it how does an individual get involved well if it's a bachelor or master student in a course project or in their final thesis then the code they write is to pass an exam it may not be paid uh, it must not be paid it's not allowed to be paid and hence they own it and if you incorporate that code their code and their exclusion right is now in your research software same thing for your phd students if they contribute outside their regular work then uh, they own those copyright that copyright and they thereby if they contribute to a project in a private capacity start owning some aspects of that research software and usually you don't want that you want the university and you as an agent of the university i'm talking to professors and researchers now who are deciding to open source you want the institution to own all the rights because then you can simply on behalf of the institution or with its agreement open source and you don't need everyone's permission so how do you do that well uh, you pay people so the students who uh, contribute to your research project code should be paid for student work and it must not be thesis work the employees uh, are your graduate researchers that's the people you employ in your research projects and if you employ them and they work in the capacity of being employed as a salaried position then the work they do is also owned by the university so simply make sure uh, to maintain a hundred percent ownership by the institution the university usually that everyone who contri contributes does that in a capacity where they are paid for their work and then the institution owns a hundred percent of the copyright and that means that the institution can by itself decide to open source otherwise you need to get everyone's agreement you can get that agreement but it's a possibly a lot of legwork and particularly a lot of students who are involved you can ask students or everyone proactively please will you allow us sign off on the so-called contributor agreement that you allow us to use it and open source it you can do it retroactively if you're going to do it retroactively it's usually better because if you do it proactively and it's uh, a student working on a master thesis there's the obvious conflict of interest a potentially difficult situation um, in general though if you want to open source the latest version only then that's all the only needs you need rights you need so past versions are not necessarily needed so let's assume you got that right or you fixed it afterwards and the university has the right to open source now uh, what well now we need to go back to the purpose of uh, open sourcing why are you doing it and this means what do you want to empower people with or what do you want them to receive so do you want people to solely receive a copyright a usage right to the code do you also want to make any patents available that are in the code that makes a difference then which license you choose also do you want to limit how the code gets commercialized by other parties if you want to limit that yet another set of licenses comes into play so simplifying um, you can use the MIT license for a pure copyright grant you can use the Apache license if you also need to grant patent rights and if you want to limit other people from commercializing it then uh, the AGPL license version 3 license is a good choice so the AGPL license is from the family of copyleft licenses I'm simplifying but there are two categories of families of licenses there are the permissive licenses and there are the copyleft licenses and this now relates to the obligations that you put on users as they receive some open source code see in the beginning of this short talk I only talked about the rights you grant 
And these rights are always the same to whoever receives the code. You can use uh, all open source software by way of all the licenses for yourself without limitations, uh, really. This is what the rights grant gives you. However, in the use case, so that's the in-house use case. However, if you pass on the code to a third party, so suddenly there's a third party, then uh, the obligations typically kick in in the licenses. Now, with respect to the permissive licenses, the obligations those have are fairly benign, meaning you usually just have to tell create proper legal notices, which means you have to tell that third party to the right are here. You have to tell them which open source code is in what you're giving them. You don't have to give the source code to what you're giving them yourself. So you can combine the original open source code you received from programmer P, combine it with proprietary code and pass on the combined work uh, as proprietarily licensed code if you're a software uh, vendor. And that's what permissive licenses allow you. All you have to tell the recipient, your customer, that there's some open source code in your product, but you don't have to give them source code. Another category of licenses, so the copyleft licenses, however, require that the original license, for example, the GPL version 2 license or the AGPL version 3 license, propagate. So if you, as uh, a software vendor here, D in the middle, receive some open source code from a programmer P under, the, under a copyleft license, the AGPL version 3 license, and combine it with your own code. You only can pass it on, sell it to customers, uh, if you use the same license that you received the open source code from. That then also applies to your proprietary code. And then your proprietary code is not uh, proprietary any longer but rather AGPL licensed and then everyone has the same rights to it and this limits the use of um, this limits the commercialization potential for those the original open source programmer P gives their code to. So if you want to stop others from making a killing meaning have a true commercial business that is not just consulting and services, but really a traditional license sale, then you use the AGPL license or a copyleft license. What does that mean for the original uh, scenarios or purposes? If you want to just dump your code, you don't really care that much. You just need to give people a usage right. So I recommend you use the MIT license. If you want to do a true community project, open source project, which I think is probably the majority of cases where you might want to open source, then all the three licenses I mentioned here are possible. Both permissive license, MIT and Apache, where the only difference is that if you use MIT, you're not granting any patent rights, but uh, Apache does imply the granting of any patent rights so your university lawyers may have well, may want to have a say in that but you can also use the copyleft license because if it's a community project then the copyleft license keeps companies away who might want to commercialize it so you're getting both good and bad you are preventing commercialization which rubs some people the wrong way but you're also not getting any benefit of these companies from using the software, filing bug reports, possibly even contributing back. So any of these three choices is possible for a community open source project and it uh, is usually based on the philosophical outlook of people of how coercive they want to be to those who receive their source code. Amusingly enough, if you are the original rights holder, the university, then you don't want anyone else, perhaps, if, you, if your intent is commercialization, you don't want any other party to commercialize the work, but you yourself can do it. So if you um, 
want to commercialize your software, the common pattern we can see these days is to, or have seen over the last 20 years, is to use a copyleft license because that stops any competitors from using your code, while you as the original 100% copyright holder can actually do a license and sell a traditional license or subscription to your software. That's a long story that uh, it goes too far here, but uh, um, as you might look into commercializing, you will have to consider this as well. So now that you know why you're doing it and which license is proper and you figured out that you can actually do it, well, you need to do it. And so you prepare your code um, appropriately. You need to put some effort into cleaning it up. Uh, you need to document it if you want to do a real community project. There simply is effort that's coming your way and you need to prepare for that uh, and so forth. I recommend you follow the reuse.software guidelines to make life easy for everyone who wants to use your software. So now that your code base is ready, you put it into the appropriate place on GitHub or GitLab and some other places. And uh, that way it gets archived and made available more broadly. For a community project, you really need to be present on any of these forges or you won't be found and collaboration won't easily be possible. So don't use your own website for that. So with that, here are some final pointers. If you want to run a community open source project, there are good books that help you understand how to do that. Most notably Fogel's Producing Open Source Software and Bacon's The Art of Community. If you want to commercialize your research software, I recommend my a course on commercial open source software startups from research and that might be of interest to you. I also support that given that I've worked in industry for a long time and have helped many startups along this path. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention and I'll be happy to take some questions.